So our guest this evening on the cusp of Pride Month is Conley Atkins. I can never say your last name. You just did. Uh, A-K-S-T-E-N-S. I always want to reorder the letters. Um, who will be talking about her memoir and essays, Without Shame, Learning to Be Me. Conley was born and raised in the Boston area and currently lives in Rhode Island with her wife, Suzanne, who's here today. And as you know, if you've read the book, she has, a, has had a varied and colorful life. She graduated from Holy Cross and earned a PhD in English literature from the University of Pennsylvania and currently teaches cor courses in Shakespeare, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment at um, Empire State College in New York. She also supervises independent studies in a whole range of things from documentary film, American roots music, gender and power in American film, history of American comic art, and many mm -hmm. other topics. She's active in Speak Out Boston, has lobbied Congress with the National Center for Transgender Equality. She's a member of the Independent Book Publishers of America and a board member of I IBP New England. This memoir follows the publication of three musical albums and an audiobook of stories that were published in Adirondack Life magazine. And earlier, um, I used the words e in essays. It's a memoir in essays because the format she chose to tell the stories make this book uh, a real joy to read because I felt like I was sitting across the table from somebody I was just That's meeting. That's what it's supposed to do. It, it worked. It worked. It definitely worked. Um, we learn about the trans journey as well as her grandfather, um, who sounds like a real character, and watching the Red Sox and recording music in the 70s and a whole lot more. So without further ado, Thank you. I turn this over to you. Thank you so much. You did your homework. I'm impressed. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks for coming tonight on a, a beautiful night. Beautiful weather is not the lecturer's friend, uh, generally. But thanks for coming in any case. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. And it is an opportunity for me. I don't take this for granted. Uh, uh, Woodstock has been uh, remarkably welcoming to Suzanne and myself. We're staying at the Shire, and Dave, who runs the Shire, said, oh, come and stay with us, you know, so uh, it's been great. Uh, much of what I'm going to have to say tonight is grounded in my own experience as a transgender person, including years of outreach, uh, working with Speak Out Boston, a very worthwhile organization that does outreach and education on LGBTQ plus and so forth issues. Uh, and my work as an advocate, before I publicly declared my transgender identity, when I was 55 and I'm 76, I'll do the math, 21 years ago, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that we're living in a time of stunning social and cultural change, exciting, challenging change to which we are all trying to adapt. Now, I'm here to speak with you briefly about just one aspect of that change, what Time Magazine nine years ago called the transgender tipping point. Well, it seems that that point has tipped. I believe the current visibility of transgender people opens up possibilities for all of us, regardless of our gender identification, to lead lives that are more fully connected to each other and to our communities. As we meet and talk this evening, I'm going to employ three principles that I use when I do outreach and education. First, we meet in mutual respect. That's, for me, a given. Secondly, the diversity of transgender experience is extraordinary. I am part of that splendid kaleidoscopic community, but I don't represent anyone else's views or experiences. I'm just here, me. Uh, people who are not in the transgender community may have some sort of a a uh, vague assumption that transgender people are kind of the same. 
boy, we are not. Uh, I go to conventions and conferences of trans people, and sometimes 800 or 1,000 people uh, from all over the world, and um, I can't find anybody like me. <laughs> Everybody's so different. It's really quite amazing. So I only speak for myself, and our presentation will be quite brief, and there'll be time for discussion and questions. You can ask me anything. There's absolutely nothing that is off limits as a question. If I can't answer your question because I don't know or I don't choose to, I will say so and I will tell you why to the best of my ability. I've become increasingly convinced how important it is for transgender people to be known, to be heard, and to be seen. What this means for me personally can be summed up in three words. No more hiding. But why should I presume to think that I ought to be visible, that I should tell you my story and that you might want to listen? I believe there are two reasons. If you begin to know me, we can start a conversation, which I hope we will do later. A conversation that might carry forward. Gaps might be bridged. Misunderstandings might be resolved. Even more importantly, my experience might speak to your own or to that of a loved one, friend, co-worker. Perhaps knowing me will open the door in your own life to the understanding and acceptance of that other person you already know, or perhaps are yet to meet. I'd like to read you a bit of the preface of my book, which I think will help to frame our conversation. I chose as a motto for the book a quotation from the Tao Te Ching. If you would know me, look in your own heart. I love that. Look in your own heart if you would know me. For most of my life, I lived in the shadow of shame. From the age of three or four, I was perplexed about whether I should be a boy or a girl. For a long time, I was afraid that if anyone discovered my confusion about my gender, there would be terrible consequences. I would surely be humiliated, maybe even locked up in a mental institution. So I kept myself hidden hidden in plain sight, if you will. I managed to perform masculinity pretty well. I lived my life as best I could, but I made sure that no one ever knew me completely. Otherwise, who would want to be my friend? How would I have a career? Who would love me? When I was 55, I decided to change that with the help of my spouse, Suzanne. The past 21 years have been a process of coming out of hiding, letting myself be known, and leaving shame behind. That process led me to write this without shame. I'm nobody's victim. I've made my own decisions, some of them good, some of them bad. I've been both wise and foolish. I've been both generous and selfish. I've been honest, and I've lied. But taken as a whole, my life has been full, varied, and rewarding. When I was writing that, I almost finished the sentence by writing, in spite of my unconventional gender. That's the apologetic mindset that's easy to fall into when you're not like everyone else. But it would be wrong to write that. In truth, I was just surprised to discover I was writing the book how much my unsettled gender identity has actually made my life richer, more complicated, certainly, but decidedly richer. I hope to share that with you tonight. I suppose my lifelong effort to come to terms with my gender has made me very alert to being alive. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. 
and my own life has certainly been examined. In the process, I've formed a personal conviction. Yes, I am a transgender person, but that does not account fully for me. It doesn't define me, and it's far from the whole story. Yet, stories are how we define ourselves. Everyone has a story to tell. Here is an early memory I wrote about in my book. Writing it helped me to come to a richer understanding of myself, and I'd like to share it with you. When I was a senior in college, I applied for a Rhodes Scholarship. My advisor for the Rhodes process told me that I ought to apply for a passport. Hey, you can't get a passport overnight, he declared. If this works out, you'll need one. To get a passport and I needed a birth certificate. I asked mother where mine was. She started a very evasive song and dance. She said over and over, you don't really need a birth certificate. Your baptismal certificate is just as good. So you say, but the passport application says explicitly birth certificate. Where's mine? Just give them your baptismal certificate. It'll be fine. It wasn't fine. The application came back, missing document, colon, birth certificate of applicant. Over Christmas break, I went into the Boston Public Records office and got my own copy. Every firstborn male child in my family had been named Thomas for generations. But on my birth certificate, there was no first name. The document said that baby Axtens had been born on February 1st, 1947. That's weird, the clerk at the counter volunteered. Sometimes we get these because the mother and father were fighting about the name, but they always say baby boy Cohen, or baby girl Sullivan. This one just says baby. Odd, huh? Actually, standing there with my birth certificate in my hand, Things didn't seem so odd. A wild cascade of things actually seemed to make sense for the first time. My fascination with the clothes and Mrs. Billing's steamer trunk. My interest in mother's fashion magazines. My resentment when a classmate, Francis, was chosen to play a girl in a second grade skit. The jolt of fear I felt when my friend Roland, whose father was a baby doctor at St. Elizabeth's, the hospital where I had been born, got angry and taunted me. I heard my dad tell my mom that when you were born, they didn't know whether you were a boy or a girl. And most of all, a mysterious medical procedure I endured when I might have been three or four years old. I was lying on my back. It was a large light over my head and the rest of the room was dark. Three adults were under the light looking at me. They had things over their faces. One of them said, don't be scared. We're just spacemen, just spacemen. Now there's a surefire way to comfort an anxious child. <laughs> Don't worry, little child. We're just spacemen. We're going to take you into outer space. Who? The next thing I remember was waking up. I was on my left side, and something was restricting me from moving. It sounds impossible in retrospect, but I'm sure no one was there with me. I opened my eyes. There was wallpaper next to the bed. It had pictures of Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse, and Pluto. I knew Mickey and Minnie. I loved Pluto. I felt safe. To this day, waking up in that room is one of the most emotionally charged experiences of my life. From something mother let slip later, I know I was operated on a children's hospital in Boston, perhaps twice. Now the word 
Intersex was never mentioned. It simply wasn't in those days. C suggested evasively that it had something to do with bleeding in your underwear. She said something to the effect that she hoped I wasn't thinking about it anymore. But if I was, I shouldn't ever have to think of it again because everything was fine now. Or did she say fixed now? A friend of mine shared a quotation with me. There is no greater burden than carrying an untold story. I've had the chance to tell mine. And uh, you'll hear and have heard a little bit of it this afternoon. I'd like to invite you to think about your own story and about people you may know who may have an untold story and may be carrying a burden of shame. And I'd like you to consider how you might help lift that burden by being a friend and an ally. My dearest friend in the trans community is an untold story. And she's carrying a burden of shame and fear. So let's spend a moment to consider what it means to be an ally. Suzanne has been my greatest ally, and she has an important thing to say about that question. But perhaps this anecdote from my book will provide an on-ramp for that discussion, which, which we can all share. About a year before my 50th college reunion, five years ago, I started to get invitations in the mail to an entire weekend of reunion events. As the date got closer, the invitations became more frequent, more insistent, and more lavish. Three panel foldovers with big color pictures of jolly families at barbecues and sophisticated couples at dinner dances. Then, a couple of months before the reunion, I began to get weekly emails reminding me that I had gotten all those invitations and hadn't responded. The onslaught of mail spooked me. I realized I really did want to see the people that I had lived with and laughed with the four important years of my life so long ago. But these people had only known me as Tom. How was I going to handle this? To start with, I contacted the organizers and proposed a discussion circle for Saturday afternoon on the history and current status of LGBT at the college. I have a lot of experience doing outreach and education as a volunteer, particularly for Speak Out Boston. So I knew I'd be on confident ground and that the session would give at least a few chance, few people a chance to get to know Conley. For some reason, Friday night seemed reasonable, manageable, cocktails, hors d'oeuvres, and some schmoozing. Now, perhaps I could dress down a bit for that. But the shindig on Saturday night was a gala. Everyone dressed to the tilt. No hiding in the woodwork then. I'm in the silly habit of buying beautiful, unusual clothes at thrift shops and clearance sales that I will never likely wear. I just like browsing the sale racks and discovering something with a striking color, beautiful fabric. So what if I spend 12 bucks and it hangs in the back of the closet? I still have the fun of the treasure hunt and the find. Suzanne helped me go through these half-forgotten bargains and unearth some appropriate clothes. For Saturday night, we discovered a black and silver geometric print cardigan and a very sleek black and silver necklace. It looked classy. I felt comfortable. We got to the Friday night gathering early, grabbed drinks and a plate of appetizers, and stood off to one side, waiting for something to happen. As my classmates filtered in, I had the odd realization that I didn't recognize them any more than they recognized me. I was relieved when a rescue party crossed the tent in our direction. Hugo, who started life after college as a lobsterman and became a maxial facial surgeon. Richard, my friend from the seventh grade, 
uh, who left a law career to become a very successful actor in New York. Brian, who was always running around campus with a Nikon around his neck and is now a cinematographer who travels the world, shooting mostly from helicopters. Like mine, their life stories had cracked the mold. We talked for a moment and Richard grabbed the arm of Michael, another old friend of ours, who was standing nearby and said, you remember Conley, of course. Michael, who had been the best man at my first wedding, looked a little bewildered, but gathered himself quickly and smiled. Oh, yes, Conley, of course. And then spontaneously gave me a hug. Soon we were at a table, all laughing and telling the old stories. The organizers of the reunion had been skeptical about the Sunday, Saturday discussion circle. What if only a handful of people came? We arrived early to set up the room and discovered one alumnus sitting patiently in a chair. Suzanne went over to greet him. He was brimming with emotion and told her, I'm just so happy to be here. I've been waiting 50 years for this. As it turned out, we had an energetic, candid discussion among about 40 people, including several of my classmates and their spouses. By Saturday night, word was definitely out, and therefore so was I. I was intimidated by the scale and glamour of the event, but my trio of allies stayed close by, and everybody was drawn to Suzanne, who was in high spirits and looked beautiful. I felt proud that we were there together and very grateful to have her and my friends as allies. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it means to be an ally and I have some materials here that I'll sh show you. You can uh, look at them. But let me open up at this point in time and, and ask if you have questions, if you have comments either about anything that I've read to you or anything I've said, or uh, just anything about the transgender experience that's been on your mind. Yes. Good, thank you. The whole transgender uh, label, yeah. I never like that word. It's so hard. And in addition to all the controversy lately around it, and all the, the politics and the religious aspect, and the, it, it, first of all, to me, it shoots up a barrier to getting to know somebody. And I mean, I love hearing you talk because uh, I'm a little uncomfortable saying this because you certainly do. You don't look as feminine as a Barbie doll. Um, so as a Barbie doll? <laughs> Did you say that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes. give me about five minutes and I'll oh, okay. uh, well, run yeah, out to the sure. car, get a few things. No, it, uh, it, yeah, sure. So, so I, my point, I, I guess I'm trying to go, what is the best way for somebody who doesn't know how to approach it, yeah. it to acknowledge the elephant in the room that you, you look? transgender, so do I say, hey, I see you're transgender, so now can we um, start talking about one of your wonderful stories in here? Yeah. Or does it tend to become the whole subject that, um, that people talk about, and it takes a while to get over it until you get to know the person better in little bits and pieces? Yeah, see, this is, this is fabulous stuff. Um, one of the reasons I'm not so enthusiastic about going to these big transgender events anymore is that that's all people talk about. And it gets pretty tiresome. And as I said in what I read earlier, this is, you know, this doesn't explain all of me. I don't like the labels either. Um, I think they are limiting. And they are, I think, necessary to a, a degree. But I used to go to a conference up at UVM that was a wonderful conference. It was run completely by students, no administrators, no faculty. 
and had a lot of energy, but uh, it got bogged down in uh, politics that ultimately didn't mean anything, sort of campus politics. But, uh, uh, as as Henry, Henry Kissinger said, that the, the reason that, that uh, political infighting is so vicious is that the stakes are so low. And, you know, this was a, a very good example of that. Um, and they, they had a thing called Trans 101. All right, so I used to go to that. And, and every year it got more and more involved in labeling. And the last time I went, it was an hour of people raising their hand and standing up and say, hi, my name is fill in the blank. And I am bi, trans, what, you know, whatever. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and, -so and uh, I am uh, gay, uh, you know, trans. What? There's an hour of that. And it didn't amount to anything. Are we defined by labels? Is that how we're going to live? Well... Uh, there is quite a lot of that now, defining by labels, and, and different kinds of identity seem to be very important. But I'm with you. I think it can get in the way of knowing the person. Now, the practical problem is what do you do? Yeah. Um, you can't really go up to somebody you don't know and say, uh, you... I, I kind of wondering if you were born female and now you're taking hormones and you have a, a you know, you can't really do that. Uh, so really, what do you do? I think you try to meet people as you would meet people ordinarily. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that has to be the first topic of conversation. Um, if it is, it's betraying your or my as the person uh, talking to somebody, uh, anxiety. I, I, I need to, I, you know, I need to get a handle on this. Uh, and sometimes there's no handle to get, which is now, you know, more and more the case. I think uh, that people are not easily uh, fitting into these little categories, taxonomy, but. Um, I think it's, it's a good idea, although I resisted this for a long time. Um, I don't like the word pronouns, but how, how would you like me to address you? Uh, I've heard this in something before. <laughs> well, the way I've just always been addressed, I guess, is my, the top, off the top of my head. Yeah. As she, as me, it's her, however. Yeah, but I think you can ask people that. Oh, I see. How would you, how would you like me to address you? So if I just sat, if, if you were sitting on a chair in the park out in front of the library, mm -hmm. and I sat down beside you, and because I was waiting for somebody else, and we struck up a conversation about a car that just went by, because I said, well, that's a beautiful car, and you said, yeah, it is too. And, uh, and again, the conversation of the wording came around to uh, how, uh, let's see, how, uh, I don't know, I can't think of how, but I would need to use he or she, and I used the wrong one, we, or the one that you don't prefer. Is that the right way to put it? And, um, would you correct me, or would you just let it pass over? It's really interesting. It's we, yeah, we had a, 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 something happen just the other night with very good friends of ours. And if they hadn't been really good friends of ours, I would have said something <laughs> ironic, strange. But because it, it felt close to these people, and I had talked with her about this before, and we were going out together someplace. I didn't want to turn around in the car and say, you know, I've talked to you about this. It just, and, I, and, and what I did is I stuffed it inside and I got mad. And that's not good. That's not good for anything. But I think ordinarily, um, you know, I'm six foot five. Um, 
I don't look like Barbie. Yeah, well, you know, I was going to let you say that. But uh, I, I don't look, look or act necessarily stereotypically female. So generally speaking, um, I pretty much take it as it comes. I do sometimes correct people about the pronouns, but not all the time, and I'm not doctrinaire about it, and I don't want to be obnoxious about it. Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, the elephant has been looked at in the room, and I feel like now I could go on with a conversation about something yes. that we're both interested in that doesn't have anything to do with yeah. Well, here's, yeah, here's, yeah, here's the other, yeah, and here's the other factor in all that is before the current controversies and publicity and and uh, <clears throat> and everything in the media. I think five years ago, there was really an emphasis in the community on um, being stealth. It was called uh, some people who were would pass and live, uh, in the case of some of my friends, as female uh, without anybody knowing mm -hmm. they was their intention. I think that's extraordinarily difficult to do now because everybody is on the lookout. Right? Everybody has got their radar tuned in. And, uh, oh, there's a, tr there's a trans person over there. Hmm. Uh, not quite like that, but I think you know what I mean. The visibility is, is a two-edged sword. Um, you know, I, I'm at ease and comfortable going most places. Uh, I'm careful. But um, I don't think, well, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I first started going out anywhere in my uh, late 50s, I would go to these conferences, and there were always places where there, were, there was a uh, shopping center, and there'd be a Nordstrom's or something. And I'd say, whoa, I'm going to go shopping at Nordstrom's, darn it. So off I would go. And, uh, or I'd go to you know, CVS or something. And, and, and a woman would invariably come up to me and say, uh, uh, could, could I ask you a question? And I'd say, sure, because I was starting to do outreach. And the question would begin, my husband, my son, my brother, my nephew, fill in the blank. And, uh, and I'd tell them about, you know, some organizations or something. And I was in one of these department stores looking through clothing, and I hear a woman's voice behind me and says, uh, excuse me, um, could I ask you a question? And I was thinking, hmm, what's it going to be this time? Husband, brother, uncle, maybe? Uh, nephew. I turned around, and the woman said, uh, have you always been tall, even when you were a little girl? So I thought, you know, gee, that's, that's just pretty nice. But on the other hand, um, my friend, my dear friend in the community, and I have a mutual friend, she's much closer, who, um, if she walked in the room and I showed you a picture and she talked and everything like that, you would absolutely never guess. Even in this context, <laughs> you, you would say, oh, gee, uh, what's that woman doing here? Uh, you know, at a discussion of transgender uh, people. Anything else that we want to talk about right now? Nothing? Would it help to talk about the whole kind of paradigm of binary, non-binary? Because I think that's what people don't always yeah. understand that it's not just wanting to be the other sex, and some exactly. people don't want to be the opposite sex. Some people 
wants to be just who they are. And so it's not about being that Barbie doll. It's not about being that caricature or idealized opposite sex. It's different. It's, yeah. it's the whole gamut is there in this population. Yeah, that's so to make the assumption, no, 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 no. Make the assumption that anybody that's transgender is somebody that wants to be the opposite sex is an assumption. Mm. You're right. That's, that's an excellent, excellent point. And um, I think I'm probably pretty much in the non-binary category of people. Um, and by having a binary construct, what we're really doing by saying, I was male, now I'm going to be female. I was female, now I'm going to be male. We're reinforcing that construct. We're not qualifying it. We're not challenging it. We're not breaking it down. We're not uh, changing it. We're just reinforcing it. And um, when I was young, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I thought I was the only person in the world that had these thoughts and feelings. There were no resources, no way for me to know anything else about anything. And so I used to, geez, I think I want to be a girl. I, I, you know, you're either a boy or you're a girl. And uh, my feeling now is much more what Suzanne was talking about, kind of, I, you know, I just want to be me. Uh, feels good to, you know, wear this bracelet and um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. Anybody want to, else want to comment on that? Because I think that's really... I, I just want to thank you. Um, I, I don't know if it's because I'm just older, but I think I was Could you speak up just a little bit? I'm sorry. Do you know Maggie Nelson's rabbi? Maggie Nelson, the critic. She She's written many books. I'm, I'm she, not hearing. I'm very sorry. Maggie Nelson, she's asking. Maggie, Maggie, Maggie a Nelson? A writer. I don't. You don't. She wrote a book called The Argonauts. Okay. And she, um, she gets a lot of attention. And she's quoted all the time. She wrote The Argonauts because her partner was transitioning at the same time she had gotten pregnant and her body was changing, his body was changing. And when I read the book, it, it just was, I've known Maggie since she was 14. She happened to be my daughter's best friend while they were growing, we, they were growing up. Yeah. So it, it was really profound for me to read this book and understand what Maggie was going through, what Harry okay. was going through. And at the same time, when my sister was very little, her best friend announced that she was no longer who she was. She was going to be John. And she would wear cowboy boots and boys clothes for forever after. She was not Emily anymore. Yeah. And so they were like three or four, four years old. I was eight years older. But suddenly reading Maggie's book, I understood Emily and why she became John. And I just wanted to give you support and be here because I just think this is so important. And when all the books were banned and we were all talking about helping ban books, the book that I wanted to get was um, Gender Queer, Give to My Grandchildren. Because mm -hmm. I feel it's so important for them to understand and to to just be aware of it. Well, see, this is, uh, may I comment on what you just said? Yeah. OK. Um, isolation is the poison. What is it? Isolation yes. is the poison if you're not like other people, in this case, in terms of gender. But it can be 
Um, and it's really important. I, I, I say what you need to do is you need to find community. That's the first thing. And people say, well, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to find community. Or what am I going to do? My daughter, find community. That's the first thing. Isolation is the poison. And understanding is the thing that breaks down isolation. Um, it kind of leads into, you know, just a sort of straightforward things like talk to people about being an ally, because it's really who you are. You're an ally. And, um, you know, Suzanne is an ally for me. And uh, what you can leave here tonight with, if you don't leave with anything else, is to be ready to be an ally for somebody. And what I say is the first rule of being an ally is to assume nothing. Just assume absolutely nothing other than there's a person who's talking with you. And number two is this isn't about you. It's about them. And he's... Huh? As an ally, as, as an ally, if I'm if I'm your ally, and you're talking to me about uh, your gender issues, that conversation is not about me. It's about you. I'm still not understanding. Okay. No, it's about me. It's, it's not about, about you. you. Okay, now I understand. Okay, now and I understand. and I at the at these big uh, conferences, uh, and really, and if you want to show, find out where the big conferences are. There's one in January at the Park Plaza in Boston, and um, we had 800 people last year or something. Uh, go to the bar for a half hour. I mean, you just are not going to believe it. It's unbelievable. And what you will hear is person A, okay, finger puppet, will say, well, uh, I am uncertain about talking to my doctor about this. Well, let me tell you about me and my doctor. I mean, it immediately shifts over, which is the least helpful thing in the world. Rather than saying, well, what is it? What is it about your relationship with your doctor? Unfortunately, that's true in the general population, I think. Yeah. A lot of people think. Oh, well, of course. It, everything gets turned around to be about, about me. Then, yeah. you know, that's understandable, but it's not being a good ally. So assume nothing. This is not about you. Uh, there is nothing wrong for you to fix. There's nothing wrong for you to fix. Uh, the most important one, I underlined three times on my list, listen, 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 listen. You don't become an ally by talking. You become an ally by listening. It doesn't mean you don't talk. It doesn't mean you don't talk about your experience at the appropriate time. Um, and it certainly doesn't mean that you don't talk when you have a chance to offer awareness of resources, what, which I think is really important. If you're going to be an ally, it's not difficult to do. Here's a couple of PFLAG publications, which I'll have after the, the presentation. Uh, PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, it's a national organization. They have, I don't know, like 600 chapters or something. I'm sure there's, you know, Montpelier, if there isn't one here, or Hanover or someplace. 
um, our trans loved ones. Great publication. Um, it's online or it's $2 for a hard copy. And um, this is really good because a lot of it is questions for parents in this particular chapter. Um, is this a phase? Who will love my child besides me? Uh, it's a really good publication. And this one I'm, I'm, I like a lot. I'm less completely convinced about it, but Guide to Being a Straight Ally. I don't think you need to be a straight person to be an ally. But um, put your assumptions in check. Well, I say assume nothing. But it's a good, good question. What exactly am I supposed to do now? OK. Um, so there's a couple of things. I'll leave them up there if you want to look at them. Or you can just go to the PFLAG website, pflag.org. Um, what else would you like to talk about right now? How about another story? Yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, we, we worked this out very carefully. That's the clue, the signal. What would you like to talk about now? You say. Uh. <laughs> what are you talking about one of your stories? I, I'd like to. Uh, so the book is about, without saying what I mean, OK. So, so it begins, it, I mean, just the cover clues us into that you're, you're transgender, and you've been looking for shame, and we, and that kind of gets it, has something to do with your sex. Yeah. So the stories in here then, I'm curious, are, are they from the, all from the perspective, uh, like how you see differently or the same as everybody else? Or, or could I read any of these stories and not even know that you were trying to Oh, you could them? certainly do that. Oh. Yeah, okay. this is just, is just a, a memoir written by a trans person. This is not a memoir about being a trans person, although there's quite a lot in here. So I'll read this story now. It's actually about New Hampshire. I just realized. Uh, as I said before, when, ooh, that's all right. Uh, when I was a child, I was convinced if anybody discovered my gender identity issues, I'd be humiliated, ostracized, and sent to a reform school or insane asylum. Because I had an idea that it, some people were sent to these reform school places for being kind of different or, quote, queers or something. And of course, this is 1956, 1958. I survived by the most rigid compartmentalization imaginable. The compartment that held my gender conflict was the most camouflaged and scrupulously hidden of all. I did what my instinct told me to protect myself. But without realizing it, I had grown up developing the skills of an addict, bigamist, or con artist. Not exactly consistent with my core values. When I was 55, I decided I didn't want to live like that anymore. And I explained to my spouse, Suzanne, I've been closeted for 50 years. I suppose I could go for another 50, but then I'd be, let's see, 105. So she agreed it was about time to find some community. But where? The internet was the obvious starting place. In 2002, a Google search for transgender yielded a strange gumbo of websites, reviews of obscure Scandinavian films, rip-off artists selling large size clothes and shoes at exorbitant prices, cheesecake photos of nightclub female impersonators, home pages of desperately lonely people, solicitations from escorts and models, 
On the positive side, there were links to websites of a few organizations that seemed legitimate. I knew nothing about any of them, so I settled on a group called TRI-S for my first contact. The name was an acronym for Society of the Second Self. The group billed itself as an organization for heterosexual cross-dressers. Well, I pondered that sort of describes me, I, I guess, maybe. I didn't recognize the homophobia implicit in their statement of purpose. I didn't realize that cross-dresser was already under critique as a reductive term. And why second self? Why not an integrated self? Anyway, my thinking wasn't that evolved in 2002. I just wanted to connect with somebody to talk to and maybe befriend. I sent an email, and after a rather Byzantine security process, I was invited to attend the group's upcoming convention in Manchester, New Hampshire. I registered the, for the event, booked a room for the weekend at the Holiday Inn, and spent the better part of the week deciding what clothes and accessories to bring. That was a challenge, since I had little fashion sense and no personal style to fall back on. Keep it simple, Suzanne suggested. So I packed a lot of basics. Everyone looks good in black, right? I had thought that Manchester was an odd place to have a convention, and when I surveyed the scene, it seemed even odder. The hotel was marooned in the middle of a vast, icy parking lot, like a vessel aground on an asphalt sandbar. The facade was welcoming, the lob unwelcoming. The lobby was cold, and my room was shabby around the edges. I began to wonder, what exactly was I going to do for the next three days? I pulled the curtains to get a better view of my dismal surroundings, like a mirage. A big red Macy's sign loomed at the far end of the parking lot. If all else failed, I could at least shop. The scheduled event for Friday night was a cocktail hour and dinner at a big Italian restaurant near the river. I spent the afternoon getting ready. I learned at least one thing during my fledgling attempt to glamorize myself. Shaving a toe is like trying to shave an okra. Every outfit I tried looked worse than the last. Basic black, drab, boring. Something bright and colorful. News flash, it's winter. Something a little glamorous? Is there anything more hideous than a 50-something floozy? The mirror was not my friend. Before I knew it, it was 6 o'clock. I was already late. I threw on something. I combed my hair and grabbed the first jewelry I saw. I rushed out the door. Well, almost rushed out the door. I had never been in public before in anything other than conventional male attire. When my hand reached the doorknob, I froze. Can I actually do this? I opened the door, peered up and down the corridor, listened for footsteps and voices. So far, so good. I made my way cautiously to the elevator. The coast seemed to be clear. I pushed the button. It was a ding as the elevator reached my floor. The door opened. I was face to face with four young Marines in khaki uniforms. Our floor, one of them said. And then, excuse us, ma'am, as they swept past me. No smirking, no irony. Four Marines, my first time out. I couldn't begin to process what had just happened, so I followed the example of sharks to keep moving forward in the water no matter what. I drove to the restaurant, rushed inside, and found my group huddled together in an alcove sort of space. I introduced myself, and people were cordial enough, the women more so than the men. Women? Yes, as it turns out, I was the only person in the group who did not have a wife in tow. Here were heterosexual cross-dressers with a vengeance. I pledged to do more, I pledged myself to do more listening than talking. I tried to gauge the group, looking to see how I might fit in. It didn't seem promising. We went to dinner, and one of the wives sort of adopted me as her protege. She was calling me dear, as if I were 11 years old. 
She managed, manufactured a compliment about something I was wearing. Then there was an anticipatory silence. It took a moment before I realized she was indoctrinating me into a female ritual in which compliments are exchanged. I responded with the first thing that popped into my head. Your, your hair looks nice, I ventured. She tilted her head, smiled coquettishly, and confided in a loud whisper, tons of spray, feels like a Brillo pad on my head. <laughs> I laughed out loud to the evident annoyance of her husband, who was sitting next to her with her own tonsorial Brillo pad. We went back to our girl talk. She told me the Marines were surprised to see us as we were to see them. Their commanding officer had put them on their best behavior. Or it's a blindfold and firing squad at dawn. She had a zany streak, and I was having fun. It was too good to last. As the meal got underway, the heterosexual cross-dressers began to completely dominate the conversation. Maybe the booze was beginning to kick in. One of the ladies began a sentence. So I told the son of a bitch. Her wife shushed her. Tension was building. Gradually, the wives retreated into silence. I realized you can take an obnoxious, middle-aged professional man, put him in a wig and a dress, and what you get, drum roll please, is an obnoxious, middle-aged professional man in a wig and a dress. I finished my scampi and apologized to my new friend for departing early. I know, she confided, I've had my fill too. And she wasn't talking about the food. I made my way back to the hotel thinking that a nightcap would suit me just fine. But the lobby was full of young Marines, this time in fancy dress uniforms. They had been joined by pretty young women in party dresses. Somewhere, a band was playing. Forget the nightcap. I took a deep breath and plunged toward the elevator. I pushed the button. Ding. The door opened. This time, I was face to face with two young Marines and their dates. One Marine said, excuse us, ma'am, as they swept past me. The other added, have a nice evening, ma'am. The girls smiled pleasantly as they passed me. I wondered if I was dreaming the whole mad episode. The answer came about 3 o'clock in the morning when I was awakened by shouts of, Oorah! Oorah! I thought the place was on fire. I grabbed the powder blue robe I had bought at Macy's that afternoon and opened the door. The hotel was built around an atrium, maybe five stories tall. A few of the Marines who had loosened up a whole lot since I would encountered them in the elevator were in their boxer shorts, rappelling down from one floor to another on ropes. Some of the pretty young women had lost their party dresses somewhere along the way and were swimming in the pool in their underwear. I watched the kids having their crazy fun for a few moments, hoping they wouldn't get hurt or busted. Elsewhere, in the bowels of the Holiday Inn, Brillo pads were resting on wig stands and heterosexual cross-dressers were snoring the night away. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Questions and comments and things? It's a great story. Well, um, there's, there was a lot of odd things in this book. I, uh, my, the, the were original working title for the book was It Hasn't Been Boring, <laughs> but uh, that didn't you last long. Do you consider long. yourself courageous? I mean, just uh, opening that door, you know, and coming out. It was out a little intense. Is, but... is, and I, you kind of alluded to that. I don't want to assume that. It was, it was fear that stopped you, but you certainly seem courageous. And, and like, did courage pop up in other aspects of your life? Do you, did you think of yourself as? No. I, I, I think I'm a confident person. And my friend Brian, see, I'm an only child, so I just had to develop my own sense of confidence. My parents were extraordinarily demanding. 
And it was either just, <laughs> you know, turn into a mush ball or become confident somehow. My friend Brian, uh, who was one of the three rescue party, he was the one who flies around in helicopters, you know, shooting movies. Um, he said, you know, you, you, to me out of the blue once, he said, you know, you're, you're the most courageous person I know. And I thought, you, you, you've got to get out more. Uh, <laughs> but I, I appreciated him saying that. But my response was, look, uh, this is so much easier and rewarding to wake up in the morning and be me than to wake up in the morning and pretend to be somebody else. That's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, I, I was, I'm leaving teaching this year, but I was a classroom teacher for a very long time. And um, I loved it. And uh, in the last, there was a period of time when I was out in the office and so forth and doing mentoring and, and whatnot and teaching seminars. But I, I wish that the students had really known me. I really wish that. Uh, and they feel kind of sad about that. But I think, you know, you, you, you need support that I didn't have. I'm an only child. I, I tend to think I can do things on my own, but you can't, you just can't really do this on your own. I'm sorry. And Suzanne provided me with the support that I really needed. And, um, you know, then the time was ready. I wasn't ready before that. No. What else? Well, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Oh. This is Thank you. Yeah. And we can have um, a little more conversation, and I'm sure that Tom can sign books if you want to wait for it. Yeah, I'd be happy to sign books. And Leslie apologized for leaving before you were done done with books. You have to go. Okay. The, uh, the books are right back there, and they're, um, they're $25. And, um, if you don't have $25, you can send it to me. I'll give you my address. <laughs> so I don't take credit cards. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.